roll it. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I often pray that God will give me opportunities to share the gospel with people, and sometimes he answers in very unexpected ways. On Wednesday morning, driving the kids into school, I was bumped from behind by an uninsured driver. There was small damage to the van. The other person was at fault and in conversations with him over the phone, told me that they would do what they could to pay for the damages. They told me, you just do what you need to do. I was on the phone with the insurance company and they said, well, the other person was at fault, so uh, basically we'll try and collect what we can from them, but other than that, you're on the hook up till you're deductible. How do we react in situations like this? If you open with me to Genesis chapter 12, we're continuing to look at the life of Abram and the other patriarchs. The opening of Genesis chapter 12, God makes Abram a promise. Abraham believes him, and he obeys. He leaves his homeland, takes his family to the land that God had promised him. Now, this, for, for many of us, would be kind of where the happy music plays. Abraham obeyed God, he's in the land, happy ending. But it's not so simple. In fact, we are given an extended look at his life in the following years for a reason. I want you to imagine what it's like when they get there. This is the land that God's going to give our kids when we have them. Any day now. I mean, maybe at first they thought, like, oh, the baby's going to be born as we get there. And then it's like, okay, God is probably waiting for us to get there. Now the baby will come. Any day now. Any time. And what happens is Abram kind of travels around for a bit. Perhaps at first wondering when it would happen and then maybe if it would happen. Genesis chapter 12, verse 10 says that something else happened. Now there is a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there. The famine was severe in the land. This was the typical response during this period of history in, in that region. The rains were pretty unsteady, and so you didn't know year to year whether or not your crops would grow or your flocks could live on the land. And so when there was trouble, they would temporarily pick up and go to Egypt. So Abraham does that. Now, I mentioned two weeks ago, Abram, as he goes there, he's afraid because Sarah, his wife, is a very beautiful woman, even in her advanced age. And he kind of tells a half-truth about her. She technically was his sister, the daughter of his father. Doesn't mention that they're married, afraid for his life that they might kill him to get her. So Pharaoh looks at her and intends to take her as his wife and does this. And for her sake, Pharaoh... He dealt well with Abram, and he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels, everyone, everything anyone could want at the time. The irony here, the time of famine, ultimately results in Abram being made very much wealthier. And as I was reading this and thinking about, man, how could I apply this to my life? I was like, man, Sarah and I need to take a trip to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Try and catch the eye of some prince there, right? And I might come home with a few hundred camels. It'd be great. Sarah was less than enthusiastic about that. Again, I will remind you to be very careful about the interpretations that we draw from the narrative sections of Scripture. Verse 17. So Pharaoh has his eye on Sarah. And so he's giving gifts to Abram. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues. Because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Now, those of you who remember English classes right in high school, this is foreshadowing. This is pointing to events that are going to happen down the road. Remember that the people reading this, right, they're leaving Egypt. They have just seen God strike a later Pharaoh with great plagues to deliver them out of the land of Egypt. This is also working out of God's promise to bless those who bless Abraham and to curse those who mistreat him, even unwittingly, as was the case here. Now, somehow, Pharaoh becomes aware of the source of these plagues, and he confronts Abram. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, 
What is this you've done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him. They sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Now again, hearing Pharaoh's name would be triggering for the people Moses is writing this to. They had come out of Egypt as a land of slavery and oppression. Under a much later Pharaoh, they would have viewed anybody associated with Egypt and their leadership as evil and oppressive and not to be trusted. He kept going back on his word. And so here, though, you have the ruler of Egypt rebuking their forefather, Abram, for his deception. How ironic that Pharaoh here appears more honorable than Abram. And yet, through this, God provided so that he returns to the land of Canaan with more than he left with. So we're told in Genesis 13, 2, now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. Now this creates a different sort of problem, as the great philosopher once said, mo money, mo problems. Abram had traveled to the new land with his wife and his nephew Lot. We're told this. And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together. For their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together, and there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. You talk to a farmer around here, and when he raises cattle, right? And they are very familiar with the math involved and how many acres you need per head of cattle. And arguments here break out because they've got too many animals and too little land for them to be sharing together. And so you have, like, not even direct arguing between him and Lot, but their workers are fighting. You know, that's, that's our spot to graze today, or that's, that's our well that we want to use. Now, understand here that God had promised nothing to Lot. He's a tag along. God didn't tell Lot anything. Abram's going, and Lot's like, okay, I'm going to go with you. So, so none of this land was promised to him. But pay attention to how Abram handles the situation. Here's what he says to his nephew. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. Now this is really unusual in the ancient world. Again, Abram is Lot senior. And those family dynamics, you know, the ancient, he would have had typically first pick of the land, but he gives it to Lot. So Lot looks around and he says, that valley looks perfect. Everything I need, I'm going to take that. Now that valley contained the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, which we'll get to next week. But I want you to understand the character traits that are on display here between these two accounts. First, what does it look like to trust God? Now, when Abram first left Canaan to go to Egypt, we're not told that he did the wrong thing. Again, that was just like standard practice of the time. But when he gets scared, he tries to protect himself. How many of us have made poor decisions in fear? We say, well, I need to look out for me. When we feel that our safety or our comfort or our well-being is threatened, then suddenly we're willing to do things that otherwise we wouldn't, like throw our life under the bus, literally what Abram did. And yet, as Abram tried to ensure his own safety, it only made things worse. Now again, the way that these accounts in the Bible work, we're not told directly that what Abram did was wrong, but any time that you have a pagan king rebuking you, for your immorality and deception, you've got a problem. And yet God intervened and rescued him from a bad situation of his own making. Now here's what I love about accounts like this. These characters are complicated. And so right after Abram patently basically says, I've got to look out for me, then he returns to the land and then he does the unexpected with Lot. Right after this reaction of fear, 
comes a decision of grace. And Abram gives Lot the first pick of the land. Now, Abram could have said, hey, this land was promised to me, not you. You go find somewhere else. Why don't you go back to Egypt or someplace like that? Think of your kids in the Halloween candy, right? But what would they say? I get the first pick. It's my candy. Then maybe if I want to, I'll give some of you, give you some of my candy. Now what Lot does, we understand, right? His motivation is much more transparent. He looks around, he finds the best thing for him, and he says, I'll take it. We're used to this mindset. We're, we're used to everybody looking out for themselves and, and making all of their decisions with the basic assumption that I'm going to do what's good for me and mine, and you look out for you and yours. Isn't that kind of what our economy is based on? You know, you read about what happens in ultra-rich families when somebody dies. If you ever think that more money will make you happy, just go read any time somebody with more than like a billion dollars in net worth dies. Instant lawsuits between siblings. Families torn apart into competing factions, scrabbling and scraping and fighting, even though they already possess more money than I would know what to do with in a hundred lifetimes. I mean, people literally sitting there saying, oh yeah, I've got five billion dollars, but I really want six billion. And, and that there's this ironic thing that happens when people get so much stuff, it sometimes makes them all the more desperate to get more of it. We understand that. We're, we're not even gracious in the small things, often. You ever go driving down the highway and you see that the, the right lane is going to be closed ahead and so all of us, we're all good drivers here, right? And so we all, we, we get politely get into the left-hand lane and we're sitting there like 15 minutes and we finally get up there and some Yahoo comes flying all the way down that empty lane and then he's going to come up and he's going to act like you owe it to him to let you in front of him? No, what are we thinking? I'm going to teach you a lesson. Is that you? Is that you? <laughs> we said, I'm not even going to give it. It wouldn't cost me, what, three seconds to let you in front of me? I'm going to get what's mine. That's my spot. What, leaving, leaving the school after fireworks, right? Man, this past year we had a screaming baby. Man, Finn was done with the day by the end of it. He's in the seat he's just, ah, ah. And Sarah's like, it's time to knock some people out of the way. Let's go. <laughs> Don't you be waving people in front of us. Come on. Just roll the windows out. Let them hear what we're dealing with. We got to take what's ours. Look, you got to understand this. If, if you're ever around me in a social setting and there's one slice of pizza left and you hear me ask somebody else if they would like it, it's not because I don't want it. To be transparent with you, what I'm hoping they'll do is they'll say, oh no, I'm good, you take it. And then I won't feel guilty, because I really do. <laughs> I want to eat it. That generosity, it's pretense. And we, we understand this very well. I'm going to get what's mine. So how do we explain what Abram does? Then? He doesn't act like the ultra-rich. I mean, no lawyers are involved here. He doesn't even act like we do with small things. God had given Abram grace. And this, this runs all through the Bible. God took Abram and he promised him something that he didn't deserve, that he didn't work for. And he said, this land is, I'm, I'm giving it to you. It is a gift. And so Abram freely gave from the gift. So what does it say about our relation to God? Here's how God responds to Abram after Lot takes the Jordan Valley as his own. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth. 
so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. It matters to God what we do with what we've been given. It matters. It says something about who you are as a person, the way you treat not just the physical resources, but your innate gifting stuff that you were born able to do, your position of life, your influence and authority. It matters what you do with that. Also, God values generosity. I'm sure Abram's shepherds were scratching their heads at this. Some of them were perhaps even a little worried, like, hey man, we got a lot of flocks. Are you sure you want to, I mean, that's prime grazing land. Are you worried about what might happen to you? Abram, we literally just had to flee for famine. Don't you remember that? Are you scared of that happening? Look at that land. It's well watered. Right? You're scared about food supply? Go and take what's yours. And you won't have to worry again. That's our mindset. Everyone says, no, I'll let him take the first thing. I'm not going to press my advantage. And what God does is he reassures him of the promise. He says, Abram, you have lost nothing. So what does this mean for us today? I'm going to zero in on a really specific tie-in here. Because really, as I think of this, if Abram and Lot were living today, you know, maybe they'd be like, instead of, you know, herdsmen, they'd, they'd run a family business, right? And the business has gotten so large that they, they've got to divide up their interests. And how would this narrative play out today? Well, as they go to divide up their assets and say, oh, you know, you're going to take this part of the business, I'm going to take that part, lawyers are absolutely going to be involved. And maybe, you know, dispute breaks out and maybe a lawsuit over Lot's fair share of the company and Lot's digging up old text messages that might imply that he was promised something that he doesn't feel that he's getting. You understand that 80% of the world's lawyers live in America? Missouri, here locally, has it is in the top ranking of states for the highest rates of personal injury lawsuits in the whole country. And even if you've never been sued, we constantly shape our lives in America around the fear of getting sued. Have you ever like gone to do something like at work or, or even here at the church and we're always saying, like, if we do this, will somebody come after us? You know, what, what if Pastor Aaron throws a kid through the ceiling? Will, will we get sued? It actually happened, but it's cool. Yeah. We didn't get a lot sued. It was, it, was, it, was, it was a spiritual illustration. <laughs> Talking about what Christ has laid hold of me and laid hold of him. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, and he brings up the fact that people in the church were involved in civil lawsuits against each other. He writes this, I say this to your shame. Can it be that there's no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers? Now brother, of course, here, I want to remind you that's just a, a catch-all, gender-neutral term. Just referring to other church members. They're suing each other. And, and it, what it, it always starts... It, as a personal argument, we, we see, see it here in this town. You know, somebody does a repair job for somebody else, and the estimate doesn't come out right, and they have an argument, and they can't resolve their conflict. And so it escalates. And then they end up in court with each other. So the first thing he brings up is he says, I can't believe that you would rather trust pagan unbelievers to render judgment before trying to settle it within the church. Don't you claim to have the mind of Christ? 
do you have anybody in the church wise enough to help you resolve this conflict? He's not saying that, you know, pastors by default have expert legal knowledge, but the root cause of it is that personal conflict. It should be settled within the church. So why are you bringing this before their judges? He also says that we are called to live differently. He says to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. So he says, why not rather let them treat you poorly? If, you've, if the only choice you've got, he says, is taking another Christian to court and giving up your side of the case, he says, why not just give it up? How did Abram respond? He and Lot had to dispute, even if indirectly through their workers. And rather than escalate the conflict, there is an easy way out. He chose to just give Lot the best part of the land. I was reading a book on peacemaking. There's actually this Christian ministry. Uh, I, I would highly recommend this book, uh, The Peacemaker by Ken Sandy. And he, and he talks about this ministry that's geared to help Christians settle civil suits outside of the court and aimed at, at reconciling the personal conflict that led to it. And he, and he gave an example of some business owners, and they're involved in this lawsuit, and, and they're going to this organization for like, hey, you know, how do we handle this? And, and they finally came to a point where he told them like, hey, just drop the suit. And they're like, but that's $10,000. And he said, go figure the cost of you going through court and the emotional you know, burden that this is placing on your families. Even if you don't think it's fair, just give it up. And they said that they did, and it was like the best decision they'd ever made. So, this past week, it, it, was, it was great. I love when God gives me a chance to like live a sermon out. Right? Because we're hit by this uninsured car. And, you know, now we find ourselves in this position. And understanding the life situation of the person who, who owned the car... Sarah and I decided, even though it would be all right, even though you're telling us, do what you got to do, that's, again, that is their default. Everybody around us assumes that everybody else is going to do what they want to do to look out for them and theirs. So I called them up and I said, you know, the, well, we're going to run it through insurance in case it goes over the deductible, but uh, we're going to ask them not to pursue collections from them. They gave me a chance to share the gospel. I said, this is what it means to receive grace. See, God loves us in a way that we cannot repay. I am not asking you to give me any promise of repayment. God loves us in a way that we do not deserve. And because he has forgiven me so extravagantly, how can I be stingy with you? It's not exactly what I had in mind for how I might get to share the gospel this past week. And I want you to understand, I'm always hesitant to share stories like this because I never want to just like set myself up as the hero of the story. I promise you, I have far more stories of basic human selfishness or panicking like Abram did uh, in my own life. But I wanted to challenge you. You're looking for the, the takeaway here, right? The next time you are in a dispute with someone else, I want you to react to them as Abram did. To say that God has given me enough grace not to pursue everything that I could. Don't be ugly about it. You don't deserve this. I'm going to give it to you. You're going to like it. Right? Sometimes that's hard. You might need to really do some praying. God, keep watch over my mouth. And yet, I promise you, if you want an opportunity to declare the love and the faithfulness of God, 
especially when you're in a situation where most people would be telling you, take hold of what's yours, to surrender that will on you. God will honor that. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the grace that you have so graciously given us. That we have been promised to be the heirs, not just of a particular land, but that the whole earth belongs to us. That you have given us the kingdom. You have given us yourself. Everything that we possess is a gift. Not a single bit of it can we claim as our own. What have we created? Our very breath is a gift. So God, I pray that you would teach us to model your self-sacrificial love in the same way that you loved us and you gave us what we could not repay. God, I pray that our interactions with other people, be they family members or not, be characterized by that same grace. In Jesus' name, amen.